Uh, welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, my name is Dave Marks, and we have a phenomenal event planned for you today. Uh, we are lucky enough to have acapella legend Deke Sharon with us today. Uh, yeah. Deke is, in, in my opinion, the most prolific, uh, uh, the most prolific member of the acapella community today. Uh, I mean, from his thousands of arrangements to his work on NBC's Sing Off and the Pitch Perfect movies, to his influence over the sound of modern acapella and kind of all the acapella music you hear today, this is really the man who started it all. So please join me in welcoming Deke Sharon. Thank you, guys. Can you hear me okay? Am I coming through the stream? Hello, people sitting at your desks. <laughs> pretending to work. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd come down here today partially just because I want to hang out with you and get a free lunch, but also partially because, in fact, my brother is working over at Google X. So, hi, Phil, if you're, if you're there in Alameda and uh, working on something you can't tell me or you'd have to kill me. I understand that. And uh, also because over the course of the past 25 years when I've been so deeply involved in the acapella community, I've learned so much about life and business and interaction that I thought I'd come down here and talk to you guys about the different lessons that acapella has to share with the world and business at large. And, and in fact, uh, special guests here today, Gugapella, are my hosts and friends. And you'll hear a little bit from them a little bit later on. But before that, I want to just put this into context. So when I say acapella now, a lot of you guys probably think, well, that's just some people singing pop acapella, right? Just, yeah, just getting together and jamming on some tunes. Fact of the matter is acapella is the oldest music. In fact, it's the oldest creative form as far as we can tell because it's existed way back into prehistoric times. And if you think about it, since we are animals, you look at the animal kingdom and you've got whales and you've got crickets and you've got birds and they all sing together. They create music for mating rituals and, <laughs> and all of the other reasons we to sing. Uh, <laughs> but then something happened through time, through history. A hundred years ago, John Philip Sousa made a statement that people laughed at at the time. When recorded music came into predominance, he said, this is going to ruin music. And people thought, oh, you old Luddite, that's ridiculous. Uh, I'm sure you guys are saying you old Luddite all the time here at Google. <laughs> But the fact of the matter, he was in fact prophetic because it changed people's relation to music. It used to be if you wanted to hear music, you made music. And you think about all those great classic novels, after dinner, people get together in the, in the sitting room and they sing and they made music. And in fact, Christmas carols, it used to be a community event. You wanted to hear Christmas carols, you made Christmas carols. But then recorded music came around and all of a sudden you didn't have to do that anymore. You could put on music in the background and fewer people sang, fewer people studied music, fewer people had music as a part of their lives. And then music started to slip down the tier of importance in education. Pythagoras had it as one of the five major subjects that people should study. And throughout most of history, music was a central part of education. People understood the importance and the strengthening of the brain that happened as a result of studying music but it's now a third, a fourth rate subject and it's being slashed in music budgets and has been over the past 20 years. Um, not just here in California, but all around the world. And then you get television shows like American Idol that openly mock people that aren't great at singing. And the end result is many of the people that I talk to say like, oh, I'd love to sing, but I can't sing. I'm like, what do you mean you can't sing? You can talk, you can sing. No, 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 I'm tone deaf. I'm like, no, you're not tone deaf. Tone deaf means you cannot differentiate any pitches. So someone who is tone deaf talks like this and they'll ask a question, are you done with that? You know, like they can't actually raise their voice at the end of a sentence. Everyone you've ever met is not tone deaf. It's just a matter of matching pitch. So you think about it from a basketball perspective. If you've never seen a basketball hoop, if you've never picked up a basketball and shot a free throw, what do you expect your percentage would be? Your, your vocal cords are just a muscle and hitting those notes, it's just a matter of repetition. All of us are able to do it. But why would you want to do it besides the fact that it's fun? The fact of the matter is there are many different lessons that we as individuals have and take from acapella music that are really important. And realize that acapella is not just singing, it's singing together. And I think the singing together part is really at the crux of the value of, uh, of, of what I want to talk about today. So listening, if you talk to a marriage counselor, 
If you talk to a therapist, if you talk to uh, negotiators, people who focus on conflict resolution, they all make it very clear the number one skill that you need is to be able to listen. And if you think about it from our educational system, what class did you really learn how to listen in? I, I don't know. I mean, you have to be able to hear when you're taking lectures or whatever. But the process of listening and one that's active is so central to what we have to be able to do when we're discussing things. When you're singing in an a cappella group, everything that you do exists in context of everyone else. If you sing in perfect rhythm and in perfect tune, but the rest of the group has moved, you're the one that's wrong. It's a lesson that you learn. It's endemic to, oh, Guga Pella's laughing over here. They're like, ha, 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 ha. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's the bottom line. Who you are, where you are, what you're doing, are you right? It exists within a context of other people, within a sociological context, within a business framework. Being able to interact with other people requires your knowing where they are, what they're doing, and that requires listening, active listening. Acapella teaches that better than any other creative form, better than any other participatory sport or whatever that you can possibly find. And uh, I just use the word teamwork, and teamwork is absolutely essential as well. Individuals, are incredibly powerful. And uh, we, we love the story of the hero, be it Indiana Jones or you watch American Idol and that's the great singer. But the bottom line is there's strength in numbers and the sum is greater than the individual parts. And I'm standing here on the Google campus. Corporations exist because bringing people together to work on a common cause is more effective than having everybody working on their own. So when you're in an acapella group, you begin to understand the value of teamwork. You realize how you guys can work together, how you fit into this overall component. And, and one of the great lessons also from, from a cappella is that if you do it right, if you do music right, everyone wins. So if you think about a participatory sport, most of the time, you're gonna lose. And I say most of the time because I've got a good friend in the Barbershop Harmony Society who above his desk has a sign that says, competitions are mostly for losers. Because <laughs> if you think about it, I don't care if it's baseball, if it's hockey, if it's soccer, if it's not basketball, because Golden State Warriors are gonna win the whole thing. But in any other sport, you realize only one person wins the Super Bowl. So even if you do well and you're above average in the, during the season, you're eventually gonna lose. Music's not about losing, and life is not necessarily about losing, or it shouldn't be. How do you win and win alongside other people, alongside your teammates, alongside your community? How can you build that, that do no evil ethos? Acapella is an amazing way to do this, and it's incredibly fun while you're doing it. So let's see what else we have here. There's so much attention that's been given to the word diversity over the past few years, several years, in educational circles, in business circles, but what does that really mean? What's the real value of diversity? When you sing in an a cappella group, you live it. The more homogenous your group is, the less interesting they are and the less they're able to do. If everybody sings the same voice part, you've got a very narrow bandwidth within which you're able to do anything. When you've got high tenors and low basses, when you've got a beatboxer, when you've got gorgeous ballad singing sopranos and raspy, soulful altos, you've got an incredible a cappella group. The diversity is what creates the boundaries within which you're able to do anything. And that's something that you live. One of my favorite things about college a cappella is that a college a cappella group is the most diverse gathering of people on a college campus. You've got your sports teams, you've got your sci-fi nerd clubs, you, you, you've got your fraternities, but in a college a cappella group, people are drawn from all of those different circles and the theater person and the goth and et cetera, et cetera. You, you end up with, you're laughing, you, you've got your own goths in, in Google Pella as well. But you end up with an incredibly diverse selection of people. And when I sang in the Tufts Beelzebubs, I made lifelong friends with people that I would have passed in four years of college and never even said hello to. I never would have crossed paths with them, possibly, except maybe in the dining hall. That bringing together of different people, learning how to interact with them, learning how to listen with them, from them, and create alongside them is incredibly valuable. And, uh, and then you never have to ask the question, why diversity? Why do I care that I would want someone different from myself? Because you realize you need them and that you are stronger for them 
and your own strengths are amplified with them right there beside you. So let's see what else. Uh, acapella is just people. So when you go see a rock concert, you've got these flame pots and giant screens, and people are playing electric guitars and synthesizers, and there's computer banks. When it's acapella, it's just you and your friends. And everything that happens, every emotion, every mood, every sound, every movement, every feeling that the audience feels comes entirely from you. There's this incredible sense of self-reliance. And obviously, I know you guys down here, you start new initiatives and new business. Like, how are we going to make something happen? Like, it's just, we've got this idea, and where do you go from there? Acapella is all about that every time. We've got this song we want to sing. What are we going to do? You have to do it yourselves. Learning how to rely entirely upon yourselves is one of the great lessons that you learn from acapella. And, and, uh, and it's a beautiful thing when you finally bring a song to life. It's uh, with just yourself and your friends. And you can do it anywhere. You can do it on the radio. You can do it at midnight at a friend's birthday party. It's, it's a good feeling. Um, so how many of you guys have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Nice. You're all overeducated down here. I love it. Well, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong, but uh, a good deal of research has been done of late to try to figure out where is that line between competence and incompetence. And it seems as though we're learning that people who are incompetent don't actually know that they're incompetent. And people who can take a test with a bunch of other people, and the vast majority of them believe that they are in the upper tier. <laughs> it's definitely the case with driving, right? Yeah, I came down from San Francisco today, and I guarantee you that most of the people on that road were sure that they were one of the best drivers on them, and not all of them were. Mathematically, it's impossible, and I could tell you the license plate numbers of the ones who are the worst. <laughs> the bottom line is, People need constant, immediate feedback in a positive way to begin to realize how they exist in this framework. And I can even think of certain people who are in different fields that affect us all, such as politics, who would have benefited from a lifetime of hearing from other people ways in which they're not actually doing a good job at the things they're doing, think they're doing a good job at. This feedback loop exists within an a cappella rehearsal constantly. You're in a section and you hear your part. Am I in tune with the other people? Am I out of tune? Am I in rhythm with them? Am I out of rhythm? You're getting this feedback from the music director. Speed this up, slow it down, tune this down a little bit. A lot of it is not just knowing that you need to change these little things. It's realizing that it's OK to be imprecise. The only way you get better is through that constant feedback loop. And so often in businesses, my wife, who's a, a business consultant and works within the human resources and making better teams and, and training high-level management to, to, to be great at what they're doing, so often she talks to leaders who are stuck in a position to have to fire somebody who's incompetent and they've been in the job for three and a half years and no one has ever actually told them that they weren't doing a good job. That doesn't ex happen in acapella, right? <laughs> you know you're not doing a good job in the first 30 seconds of rehearsal. <laughs> and I say it with a smile on my face because in acapella, it's okay. You're gonna be making mistakes constantly. The human voice is a fretless instrument. You're able to slide all over the map. You have good days, you have bad days. And all of you together are used to making mistakes together and to learning how to be better at all of the things that you need to be better at. And here, you're great at this and you're usually great, but today you're having a bad day. Down here, you're usually struggling and, and you're making big strides. That feedback loop is one of the most powerful things that people can learn which is one of the reasons why I feel like we need to continue to have this kind of vocal music in schools so students can learn what it's like to be with others, to make mistakes, and get that immediate feedback. Ah, let's see what else. So all of this has been about the group, but what about you? When you're in an a cappella group, you start to get a clearer picture of who you are. What's your role? What are your strengths? What are you able to do well? And uh, people often ask me, well, what solo could I sing? How do I fit in? There are all these great other people in the group. Where, where's my voice? There is a great song for everyone to sing. The, the Randy Newmans in the world and the Tom Waits and the Bob Dylans, right? The guys with this voice, right? There's a great song for you out there. There's an incredible body of work that's been created throughout humankind. And you have something inside of you that's incredibly beautiful. You have a song to sing. And when you're in an a cappella group, you learn what that is. And that's a great feeling. 
we, we all have value. And I know this feels like a very 70s thing. Yeah, I'm a child of the 70s, Northern California hippie. But that's an important lesson. Maybe the millennials that are getting teased too often learn the lesson that everybody's great. Not everybody's great at everything. That's a lesson that is absolutely detrimental to society. But finding out how you're great and what you can give, that's the real gift. And that's one of the things that acapella definitely can give you. Um, and then there are just straightforward things that we all need in life. We need health, we need happiness, we need friends, we need endorphins and oxytocin and all the great chemicals that our bodies produce for us when we have positive experiences. There has been study after study by Chorus America and the American Choral Directors Association and, and our educational circles that, that show how we, when we're creating something alongside other people, feel happiness. When we sing, we feel happiness. The natural rhythms of our body in alignment with other people, it lowers our stress level. It brings joy into our lives. And, and uh, this is something that's very clear. You can read articles out there by Brian Eno who had a life of, of creating music and what he decided he needed more than anything else in his life was to join a choir because when he sings alongside other people, it brings him more joy than any other creative pursuit that he's done. So that's, that's another important part of it. And then there are social benefits as well. There's so many, so many people who are, are sitting in their cubicle, like you guys right now watching this, who are working in many cases alone or on a small team and they don't feel as though they're interacting with other people, particularly people who are very different from themselves. And the great thing about a group like Google Pella here at this wonderful company is that you have people across all strata of the organization, right? Including one of the members who's the massage therapist, is that right? Still? Yes, exactly. But, but, but what I'm saying is you sing in this group, you get to understand and make friends with and spend time with people across the entirety of this enormous organization, not just your little team. And you'll make friends, fall in love, Make little Google acapella babies. I don't know, you guys, that's, that's the next step there. And I'm sure they'll be wonderful and bright and, and have four colored little baby jumper outfits and the whole thing. But the, the social benefits are very clear from singing in an acapella group. And again, like I said, if you do it right, you always win. So that's all nice. But then what's the value to the business? People are working hard. There are long hours. People are drained. But Google Pell is not drained. You guys go to rehearsal of your own volition. You want to spend more time with other people here. This recharges your batteries, right? There's a joy that you feel and you sing and then you're recharged. My daughter goes to a performing arts school called Ada Clevenger up in San Francisco. And their educational model is very different from what I've found anywhere else and she loves it. What happens is they all get together at the beginning of the day and they all sing music and then they break up each grade and they have math, they have English and then you have theater. And then you've got science, and then you've got history, and then you've got dance, and then you've got creative expression. And by going back and exercising different parts of your body and your mind and creative spirit throughout the day, this kind of cross-training, as it were, allows for a much greater experience. And then you're refreshed throughout. You're not sitting in a desk the whole day doing the same thing. So join Gugapella, okay? <laughs> I know they got a waiting list. They need tenors, though, is my understanding. <laughs> tenors. No, no, you got your tenors? They're all set. They, they don't want you. Stay in your seat. They're, they're fine. Start another group. Uh, Google, Oogapella. I think you could be part two of the whole thing. But there are definite benefits to a company, and I hope that other companies find out and learn about this. Obviously, the Tech Capella concert with eight different groups this past November was amazing, and now there are a bunch of other groups that have gotten started that want to join the Tech Capella concert, and they got to get on that list, don't they? Yeah, we'll see if there's room for you this next year. But this is a beautiful thing. One of my mottos for life is to spread harmony through harmony. Another one is to sing for your life. And people sing through school, and they sing in college acapella groups, and they love it. And then it just ends for them. And that's the end of their creative expression. Having this be a part of a company that's so much a part of your lives reinforces the power and the strength, that, that, the value that a company can have beyond just a paycheck. It's a circle of friends. It's a, opportunity for creative expression, and uh, it's a family. 
in, in a real way. And they're nodding. It's, yes, it's a family. It's not like, yeah, we know we're supposed to nod now. No, it really it changes your relationship with what's going on. And there's great value to a business to have that there. So my vision is that these kind of casual acapella groups will start to spring up in companies all around. A hundred years ago, people would get together with their company, General Motors or whatever, and sing company songs. And I mean, it was, it was a kind of a thing. And, and people would be in, employed by the same company for their whole life. And there was a lot less stress in society back then. There was, you were a company man, and you felt like you were part of this company. Obviously, our society has changed. But with more groups like this within businesses, the different values and, and the, the different benefits that can come from acapella can belong to that company as well. And the members of the group will definitely feel more valued and more connected to what's going on within the business. And uh, once again, guys here at Google, you get to say, we did it first. <laughs> so that's that. Sing. That's what I'm telling you to do. And uh, hopefully some of you guys out there will take this to heart. And if there's anything I can do to help you do that, deconteeksharon.com. I will get you singing. Thank you. So, Deke, to start, yeah. uh, I mean, as of now, you are you know, an acapella legend and really a standard of the community, but you kind of have carved this role for yourself. Can, for people who aren't as familiar with your background, can you tell them uh, about how this opportunity kind of came to be and your growth since the Beezle Buff? Yeah, well, it, 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 it wasn't an opportunity. It was just a crazy dream. Basically, when I was music director of the Tufts Beelzebubs, I wanted to sing the kind of music that was on the radio. So long story short, I started integrating beatboxing and different vocal instrumental sounds and turned what was very much a four-part harmony style into a 14-person group would do 14-part harmony, and you'd sing the kind of crazy songs on the radio that back then were impossible to do. Peter Gabriel and Led Zeppelin and, and U2 and Pink Floyd. I mean, back then it was all Shooby doo Wop, Billy Joel and Crosby, Stills and Nash. All great, but the, there was a thing to be unlocked. And, and when you look at music history, throughout music history, there's been a cappella sea shanties and madrigals and barbershop and doo-wop. So what we're doing now isn't different fundamentally from a cultural standpoint. It's just different technically. So when I graduated, I was like, I feel like I have lightning in a bottle. If people only knew what this was, they would love it. And everyone, including my high school choral director, laughed at me. He, he likened it to tiddlywinks. He, he literally told people, this guy wants to create a career of this college acapella thing that he's doing. And it's like, He's like, I want to create a career of tiddlywinks. Like, we'll have tiddlywink networks and tiddlywink societies and tiddlywink competitions. He's like, I feel bad for him. <laughs> and now he's like, okay, you were wrong. It worked out. So yeah, it's just been a lifetime of following this crazy dream and wanting to help more people sing and spread this kind of music, both from the bottom up and create more groups, and also from the top down through the media. Mm -hmm. Get more people singing the way that has happened throughout human history. And getting back to that like modern sound of acapella, because I don't people who haven't listened to old acapella might not realize that it doesn't always sound like it, we hear it on Pitch Perfect like it does today. And you were a big influence in that. Can you tell me about kind of the evolution from the doo op shooby doo ops into the sure. using the voice, voice as instruments? So, when I was in the Tufts Beelzebubs, I just wanted every woman in the audience to love us and particularly me, because that's really what college acapella is all about. It's, it's a giant campus-wide mating ritual. And uh, at Tufts, the, 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 the Beelzebubs were like rock stars on the campus. So like, you, you already felt there was an importance to what you were doing. And I was at the same time at New England Conservatory of Music uh, in Boston, and I went by Tower Records back and forth several times a week. And I would stop at Tower Records when the new Billboard charts were always posted, because I wanted to sing a song that was going up the charts. So I'd stop by on a Tuesday, find out what that song was, arrange it, teach it to the group Wednesday and Thursday night, and then Friday and Saturday night, we'd sing it that weekend. And it, I know, I was crazy. I was, yeah, totally. I went to class sometimes, too. <laughs> Underline sometimes. I like to say I went to Beelzebub's University. Anyway, uh, there were so many songs that you just couldn't make work, like Duran Duran, that people were loving and listening to all the time on college rock radio stations. And, and yet everything was still the longest time, and should we do up, as you were saying. So there was a song in a movie, Boombox, above John Cusack's head. And I was like, this, every woman in the audience will melt if we could possibly sing In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. So I went back to my dorm room, and I started listening to it, and I like heard all these talking drums. 
all these shakers and stuff, and I was like, I can't, you can't shooby doo wop your way through the song. So I took out a big piece of orchestral music paper and I just started jotting down the different parts that I heard, and I ended up bringing an arrangement into the group that was like 12 different vocal parts. And they looked at me and they're like, dude, what is this? I was like, just trust me, just make these sounds and do this thing, and they're like, you get a half an hour, that's it. Anyway, by the end of the rehearsal, they're like, all right, we'll try it. Uh, this weekend at the at, you know the concert, I think it was up in Maine, and it was one of those moments when we were done singing the song, that it's like the end of a movie. There's this silence from the audience, and then all of a sudden, rah, this giant wave of energy came up, and I realized like, whoa! So I started dabbling in this more, and we were trying to figure out how to do vocal percussion with our voices, and and use the voices as instruments, and just really repositioning what collegiate acapella could be, and. Uh, yeah, it was a crazy year, and from there, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna keep doing this thing. And even the guys I graduated with were like, dude, you're nuts. It's <laughs> never gonna happen. Nobody... And, and back then, there were maybe 200 college acapella groups, and now we've got 3,000. And I wanted to create a, a March Madness of acapella so people would know about this, so I created the NCCA, the National Championship of College Acapella, which is now international, so it's the ICCA, and it's a real competition, and then it's in Pitch Perfect, so... Yeah, there's a lot of luck involved for anybody who's wondering. So if someone were to do the same exercise you did of like look for a song that was rising the charts and try to like arrange it by the weekend, in 2016 they might find it full of like electronic dance music or maybe some like trap rap, you know, right. um, type type things. What kind of impact do you think that'll make on the acapella community? So if you look at all the other styles of acapella, think about doo-wop and think about barbershop. These were very popular for a period of time and then they disappeared. My great hope for the future of acapella is that these high school and college groups are doing exactly what you're talking about. Pentatonix, biggest acapella group out there right now, when they were on the sing-off, they were developing their own sound and I was working with them each week and they started to integrate dubstep and, 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 uh, and, and EDM, electronic dance, you know, music sounds and, 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 and dropping the bass and all this kind of stuff that really wasn't happening in acapella and now it's a full part of their sound and they are super cutting edge. And three years from now, five years from now, there will be some new like reggae with laser blasts in it or some sound that we don't know what it is, but there's gonna be, there's gonna be an eager music director who's gonna take and figure out how to do that vocally, weave it into the sound, and hopefully, unlike in the past, the style and the sound of contemporary acapella will continue to remain on the cutting edge. And people will still have classical music and barbershop and doo-wop and, and the sound that we have now. It'll all continue and coexist, which is why I call it contemporary acapella, because it's all being done at the same time now. Thanks. Uh, so I'd like to jump over to your involvement in the Pitch Perfect movies a little bit. So you served as music director for the, for the Pitch Perfect movies. Yeah, right? actually, my understanding is the Directors Guild of America controls the word director, so you can't have a music director on a movie, so I'm technically vocal producer. <laughs> yeah, and I taught the arrangements, the actresses, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, could you walk us through a little bit more of like your responsibilities on the project, what a day at work looked like? Um, yeah, yeah, well, the there was a lot of lost sleep the first time around because it was like, these actresses have never sung a cappella. Are we gonna actually be able to have a movie? Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, what happens is early on in the process, we have something called a cappella boot camp which every day they all get together and I do big group rehearsals as well as one-on-one -on -one rehearsals with all the actors and actresses. And they're also in choreographic rehearsal with uh, AJ, who is an amazing choreographer, works with Usher, et cetera. And they basically sing and dance and sing and dance and sing and dance till they're really able to do this on their own. Once they're able to sing their part alone for me, pretty much from memory, I'll send them into a recording studio that we've built right there in the production offices. And they record their own part all the way through and then the reason they need it memorized is they'll be lip syncing to themselves on set. So the early part of the process is a lot of sleepless nights and hard work and let's adjust this arrangement, I gotta make sure she's up to speed on this. And then the, the latter part is a lot of sitting outside in an August night, sticky from dusk till dawn, watching a bunch of actresses lip sync their parts over and over while they're dancing and then going up on stage and saying, Brittany, remember you don't have the melody there, you gotta go wah, zim, 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 zim. She's like, oh, right, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. And then, okay, let's do it again. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, sometimes it's like really creative and other times it's like, yeah, lip sync patrol, yeah. But whatever it takes to make the movie.
Um, so I only have one more, so if you want to start lining up for audience questions, we're going to uh, pitch to those in a second. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep making them up as I go along. <laughs> but uh, I'd say, what's next for Deke Sharon? What, what can we see coming out of you? What are you most excited about? Well, I've got a, a, a national theatrical touring show called Vocalocity that's going back on the road and it'll be coming out to the West Coast, which is really great to be in performing arts centers. And, and the thesis of the show, although I never say it and never have the singer say it, is to try to convince more people to bring singing back into their own lives. Um, there's a great musical that I did the arrangements for called In Transit that was written in part by Kristen An Anderson Lopez, who uh, was half of the songwriting team that wrote Frozen. Uh, and her husband, Bobby Lopez, who did Avenue Q and Book of Mormon, uh, they are like royalty on Broadway right now. So we have everything, we have funding, we're just waiting for a house to open on Broadway. That's one of the big challenges. So Broadway is soon to be coming next. And, uh, there's a whole new program that I've created called the Contemporary Acapella League, which basically is to create after work groups kind of like Gugapella, where people from an entire community can get together and sing casually once a week and make friends and fall in love and keep music a part of their lives. Yeah. Great. And the other things I can't, it's like Google X. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Sounds fair. <laughs> we'll stay tuned. Yeah. Kiana? Yeah. It's good to see you again. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, doing really well. Um, first, I have to say, I totally, everything you were saying today was extremely resonant. Like, I was like, yes, 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 yes. yes. And I have to say, like, I did college acapella, and I was in a group called Talisman out of Stanford. You might have heard of them. Oh, I think. No, I got to cut you off right there, because Stanford Talisman, in my opinion, is the single greatest ICCA set I've ever seen. Okay, this is in the mid, mid, oh, no, I'm not making this up. <laughs> In the mid-90s, all these groups were going out on the final stage, and back then we had it at Carnegie Hall. And uh, they went out on the stage, and they sang, and they danced, they moved around, all this kind of stuff. And then Stanford Talisman came out, and they stood in a big arc, and they made everybody else look like children. They sang songs from the African diaspora. They got the entire audience just melting. And there was so much purity, so much harmony, so much heart in their music that they were runaway favorites. And there's a little piece of me that, that hopes that the college a cappella world realizes that not everything needs to be glee. Not everything needs to be pop, pop, pop. But there's a lot of amazing music happening all around the world. And when you draw on it as an inspiration, you're able to take things up to the next level. So yeah, so that's Stanford Talisman. <laughs> so Good job. you saw that, you obviously know how that has worked in my life and how what of a wonderful course. privilege that was to yes. be a part of that, like crazy to this day. Um, we're actually all getting together next weekend and it's awesome. gonna be ridiculous. Um, but I say all that to say, you spent a lot of time talking about getting people together to sing. And I'd like to ask you, I know you're with these people all the time. I know you're singing and interacting with music all the time, but when do you get to sing with your friends and just be Deke on the tenor part one? Like, when do you <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is I created a group 25 years ago called the House Jacks, and I love being on stage and performing, and we toured around the world, and we were the first group with the designated beatboxer and, and to push the sound into the, into the contemporary realm and into the professional realm. But last year, because I'm so busy with movies and television, and I was on Lifetime or whatever, I had to hand in my pitch pipe and basically say, guys, you go on without me. I'm still getting an opportunity to perform. I performed with you guys at Carnegie Hall a couple months ago. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I was just back a couple days ago uh, with Highlands Voices uh, and Stay Tuned in northern New Jersey at a wonderful festival where I sang a couple songs with them. So I'm still getting up on stage and I'm singing, but I really feel like what I need to do right now is be that elder statesman and, uh, and get up in front of people and sometimes I'm directing or sometimes I'm talking and I'm not always the one doing the singing. But uh, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep singing through there too. Thank you for asking that. Sadiq, thanks. Uh, I also sang college a cappella and uh, had the great opportunity to sing at the finals of the ICCA. Oh, great. Um, what group? Like, uh, Cornell Last Call. Nice group. group. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I won't great. say how long ago because I don't want to give away my age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> way, way too long ago. Um, but uh, so first of all, thank you so much. That was one of the incredible experiences of my life. And so I want to say course. personal thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I also talked a lot about how basically everyone can find a voice and be able to sing. Uh, given the competitive nature of a cappella and you know, taking it to competitions like the ICCAs and even just the competitive nature of getting into a group to begin with in sure. colleges, you know, what would be your advice and guidance for those who, who may not have the opportunity to sing with some of those elite groups that go on to do all the various things? Oh, totally. Well, the great thing is uh, that within the collegiate a cappella world, for instance, there are 3,000 plus groups out there. Only 300 are doing the ICCA. So, 
bottom line, you've got 90% of them are not competing. They're just in the group to sing and make friends and fall in love and go on road trips and do all the great things. And when I was in the Beelzebubs, we never competed. It was actually part of our mantra. We were like, we don't ever want to compete. Music shouldn't be about competition. Uh, and honestly, I didn't start the ICCA because I wanted people to compete. I did it entirely for the audience to create a March Madness. And every time I'm backstage, I go to all the singers and I'm like, guys, these are your friends. You want them to be great. We want to spread all this music. And you're here, you already won. Don't, and that's what I told people in the sing-off as well. And the great thing that's happening on college campuses is if, if these elite groups are already full, more groups are getting started and more and more. I'll bet you if you went back to Cornell, you'd be like, I can't believe how many a cappella groups there are now. And at some schools like Yale that don't have fraternities and sororities, they have like 20 a cappella groups. Yeah, I know, totally. And you guys, the people are like, really, Yale? They're so busy studying. You guys work at Google and you have time to sing a cappella, okay? <laughs> There's time in your lives. You can make time for it. And it actually makes everything else easier and more fun and recharges your batteries. So the beautiful thing is I'd say only a small portion of what's going on in contemporary a cappella involves competition. And uh, for most other people, it's just happiness and joy and love. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that great question. Hi, Deke. Thanks Hi. so much for coming. Of course. Um, so you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of what drew you to acapella is the ability to be completely creative and innovative with your sound. So would you mind either demonstrating or perhaps teaching the audience here today one of your favorite or most innovative or creative sounds that you've explored? Oh, wow. OK. You want the trumpet? OK. OK, I'll teach the trumpet. But first, so that. You guys know what I'm talking about. So there are so many different instrumental sounds you can make with your voice. You could do a regular trumpet, like, like a trombone, or a flute, or like an electric guitar. But what they want is, they want the muted trumpet. I know, this is, it's amazing that it's a marketable skill now. Uh, what they want is the muted trumpet, which sounds a little like this. Uh, which uh, is both occasionally useful from a musical standpoint, and also if you're on long drives, you can get whatever you want. If you're in the back seat, you say, OK, fine, we'll change the radio. So the best way I can teach this sound uh, is actually what I, what I call the Cartman method. How many of you guys are familiar with South Park? <laughs> right? Okay. So, you know, Cartman takes like this. He's down here. He's just like, hey, guys. He'll say, hey, guys. Hey, guys. And then he's like, I want my cheesy poos. <laughs> and then he gets excited. He's like, oh, my God. So keep that ugly tone. And then you take that and then you're going to close your mouth around it. So listen. Try that. Did you hear how that just got pretty, all you singers over here? You were like, and then I was like, go, and you went, no, you have, to, you have to lose all of the beauty in your voice. You have to keep that kind of nasty. So keep the, now go, You're getting there, and uh, I've, got, I've got a YouTube channel with all these different instrumental sound, little videos, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, there are, and if you come up with an instrumental sound, and teach me how to do it, because it's not like there's a school you can go to for annoying vocal noises. <laughs> we're, le we're deriving this. This is a new cutting edge technology. So if you want to start a new team at Google for that, you know, let me know. And I won't tell anyone. We'll keep it secret. Yeah, awesome, thank you. So you have someone who isn't a singer or isn't a professional singer, and they've seen professional singers, or maybe they've, they've memorized sort of, but not really, and they've never actually memorized a piece. They've had the experience over and over again of thinking, I couldn't do that, or I can't do that. How do you take that person and motivate them to reach their next level? So I, I mentioned a, a basketball analogy earlier, and, and I want to take it one step further. So we watch Steph Curry and the Warriors break records and play amazing team basketball at the next level. And if you get too focused on what he's doing, you may think, I should never play basketball. He's too good. You may watch Prince sing and be like, I got no business doing that. But that's ridiculous. 
if only the greatest chefs cooked, we'd all starve to death. So the proficiency of the, of the experts should in no way inform the rest of us as to our, our ability to do it. Um, moreover, if you're driving on a Sunday afternoon past a high school uh, basketball hoops outside and you see some 35, 40 year old shooting hoops, you don't think anything of it. You're like, oh, they're having a good time. But you go to the farmer's market and you hear some 35 and 40 year olds singing and you probably immediately start judging them. Ooh, I don't know if that's so great or whatever. That's something that's broken in our society. We are too critical of the arts, particularly from a participatory standpoint. And part of what I want to do is change that dialogue we have. I cannot tell you how happy I am that American Idol's off the air because I think they've done enormous psychic damage to people who now only sing it in their car and in the shower and maybe once a year at karaoke when they're drunk. Like they're terrified that they're gonna be called out for not being great. So I think we just need to remind them, everybody, that okay, you're not gonna be Picasso but that doesn't mean you should never jot down a line drawing and you're never gonna be Thomas Keller so that doesn't mean you shouldn't cook dinner for your friends. You know, you're not gonna be pentatonics, but singing is fun, and you should sing. Thanks. And then if they don't do that, punch them and drag them to your next rehearsal. <laughs> and when they wake up, you've got them chained to the chair, and uh, they don't get to leave until they sing a perfect major third. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good luck, let me know how it goes. And I'll testify at the trial if I need to. I'm happy to. ID. So I, I had a question for you. You, know, sure. you mentioned that, that uh, singing is a, a, the voice is a fretless instrument. Yeah. And I, I was curious, how much, when you're doing this kind of arranging, how much do you think of the way chords sound like when you're not forced to have you know, uh, you know, equal temperament, for example, versus you know, what you can do with the voice and the kinds, of, the kinds of harmonics that you can use effectively in vocal harmony? I'm about to get super music theory wonky. I hope I don't lose you guys, especially those of you watching the Google Tech Talk. They just went, click, okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, okay, so, so basically the bottom line is the human voice creates sound that exists within physics. And we are able to sing in better tune than a piano or a guitar because they're really locked to this well-tempered tuning system that is fundamentally imperfect. We made this trade-off so that then we could have harmonic changes. Otherwise, what you get is like Indian classical music, which remains in the same key, the same mode, the same rog the whole time, and you can have a melody, but you don't have any harmonic changes. Th those are your two options. So I think it's a good trade, but it's still imperfect. The one thing I really do think about when I'm arranging is keeping the voices spread very much the way that exists in the physics of sound, the harmonic series. You can look it up online, Wikipedia, I'm sure. Google has their own several pages somewhere online of the harmonic series and the way that every note casts a number of harmonics above it. To make a long story short, it means keeping your bass notes low and your other voices closer voiced up above because what that does is it allows you to tune more easily. And what I try to do in my arrangements, as much as there's a lot of joy in them and a lot of complexity, is to make it easy for people to do things like tune so then they can focus on connecting with an audience and emoting rather than spending their entire time having to worry about the mechanics of what's going on. So that's, that's really my go-to. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. And you can come back now. Click, unmute. Okay, good. You're back. <laughs> it's funny, just as an aside, that you mentioned that because in, the, in Georgian singing, their scale is based on the fifth and their octaves are therefore out of tune, so they can't have deep basses. They have to keep everything within about an octave and a half or else they're out of tune. Wow, you, that's Georgia over in Russia. Yeah, yeah not, of course. Not, not where the peaches are. No, I called, United, I called United Airlines once and I needed a flight to Georgia and they're like, it's gonna be very expensive. And I was like, uh, no, I want the one here in the US. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway I was, uh, I've been directing a community course for about 20 years. Um, focusing mostly on world music and traditional music. And I like the comments you made about, uh, about Talisman. And uh, I've just been thinking about, as you, were, as you were speaking about all these things, and the element that I really pay a lot of attention to that was sort of missing from what you're talking about was the cultural element. Um, because I really focus on music that comes from places. Right. And I think that in addition to everything that you said, one of the things about doing that is that you're bringing a sense of place and a sense of culture into play into people and and both the singers and the audience. Um, and I think that's really important. And I see, well, American Idol especially, but a lot of a lot of modern uh, music that's very pop oriented is great in its own ways. But we're losing a little bit of sense of that 
global connectedness and you right. know, groups like Vocal Sampling and groups like what Keith Terry's doing and yeah. lots of those groups try to get there, but it's it's hard for Americans to hear that stuff and be aware of it. I just want well, to wonder the, where you're coming One of the great things about acapella is once people fall in love with the sound of the human voice, they're much more likely to, to move into different styles of music. And in fact, singers are able to blend styles more easily than other styles of music. So you, you go to a King Singers concert and they start out singing early music and then they go into 20th century classical and they may sing some classical choral music and then they go and they sing some early folk Americana and maybe some jazz and they end with some, some pop. No instrumentalist can do that because they need like early music instruments like recorders and sack butts and then they need an entire string orchestra and then they need some world music instruments and a jazz combo and a rock band. Like it's, it's never done. So you're able to travel around the world more effectively with your voice than you are with any other style of music or any other instrumentation more correctly. And the beautiful thing about what's going on in acapella now, and you may not see this with pentatonics or on YouTube, but the fact of the matter is different styles of, of acapella are becoming more popular based on their local roots. So you go to Taiwan, which has a tremendous tradition of acapella singing, and uh, you get a group like the Okai Singers who are blending Taiwanese pop music with this traditional Taiwanese style. Or when I made the sing-off in China, we were taking Chinese songs and blending them with popular idioms. So you'd get some old Maoist song with disco beat. And we just had a lot of fun being really crazy and creating a new sound and style of contemporary Chinese a cappella. And for anybody who's in America thinking like, well, but everything's homogenized here. There's no real sense of place. I, I tell you, so little has been done and so much it still exists. First of all, where's the great Hawaiian a cappella group? Where's the great Cajun a cappella group, right? We just on the sing-off created the first ever country a cappella group with Home Free. There's a vast, where's the great Latin a cappella group that's gonna tear up? I, hope, I was hoping Nota would do that and, and, and vocal sampling from Cuba is tremendous, but there's still so much, so many stones that haven't been uncovered. Plus, you can blend these different styles. Take six took gospel melodies, jazz harmonies, R&B stylings, and created a style that's all their own, and now they've got dozens of Grammys as a result of it. Within a cappella, there are so many frontiers that haven't even been bridged yet. So keep pushing, and, and, and do look for location, and do listen to the great Bulgarian women's choir tradition that happens over the Les Mystères Voix Bulgaire. I almost did a Bulgarian Fulbright before I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna do this pop thing because I just love that sound so much. And oh, there's amazing singing going on down in Australia and Sri Lanka, like all around the world. So look for that and, and you'll find it. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, let's hear it one more time for Deke Sharon. Thank you guys. My pleasure.